Welcome to another episode of the IFC's Individuation Podcast. I am Dr. Lahab El Samurai. With me today is the usual crew, Lisa Hong and Dr. Eric Tomlinson. And we today have veered off uh, von Franz to uh, and her ar archetypal symbols and fairy tales to a modern fairy tale by Christopher Nolan, um, a movie that was done in 2010 uh, with the title Inception. Um, and we're gonna start out by uh, letting our um, group uh, say hello to our listeners. Uh, Lisa, you wanna say hello? Hello, it's great to be back. Eric, you wanna say hello? Greetings, listeners. And, uh, Eid Mubarak to everybody. Uh, today is the first day of Eid. Um, now, uh, why don't we start by um, the summary of the movie uh, because it's, uh, it's the best way to go so okay. we could explain what the plot and what they're doing. And uh, like we read the usual fairy tales, Lisa's gonna read the fairy tale for us. Or in this case, um, the movie for us, the summary of yes. the movie. Yes, I have a plot summary written by Grade Saver. So thank you, Grade Saver. And uh, here we go. Story is described. A man named Dom Cobb wakes up on a shore and is dragged into a house belonging to a wealthy Japanese businessman named Mr. Saito. Cobb's partner, Arthur, appears and together they explain to Saito that New dream sharing technology has rendered thoughts vulnerable to theft, advertising their securities, services to Saito as dream sharing experts. After Saito leaves, Cobb uh, steals documents from a safe upstairs and is apprehended by Saito and a woman named Mal, or Mal. Uh, Cobb shoots and kills Arthur, who wakes up in an apartment where Cobb and Saito are revealed still to be asleep and dreaming. As the dream in Saito's mansion collapses, all of the men wake up in the apartment. Saito reveals that he set up the operation as an audition and the men wake up again, um, moving in a, uh, in a moving train. Later in Kyoto, Saito then asks Cobb whether he can perform inception. Uh, Saito tells Cobb that if he can plant an idea in the mind of his business rival, rival Robert Fisher, he can reunite Cobb with his children in the US. Against Arthur's judgment, Cobb con uh, consents to the plan and travels to Paris to find a dream architect. Uh, Cobb's father-in-law, Stephen Miles, introduces him to uh, Ariane, 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 thank you, <laughs> Ariane, Ariane. Um, a graduate student skilled in creating labyrinths. Cobb introduces Ariadne to the basic rules in terms of dream sharing technology, such as a totem. Uh, a totem is an object that lets a person know they are not dreaming. And a kick. A kick is a physical jolt that brings the dreamer out of a dream. Although Cobb's first rule is never to use memories to build dreams, the memory of his dead ex-wife, Maul, violently invades his shared dream with Ariadne. Cobb then travels to Mombasa to uh, recruit Ames, a British forger, and Yusuf, a Kenyan chemist, to aid with the mission. Back in Paris, the team convenes with Saito to discuss the plan. Ames uh, maintains that the incepted idea must be simple, seemingly self-generated, and planted over three layers of Robert's dream. Ariadne becomes worried when she infiltrates Cobb's dream one night and learns that he still harbors feelings of guilt about his dead wife, Mal, whose memory keeps erupting into his dreams. Ariadne warns Cobb that he cannot keep Mal imprisoned in his subconscious forever. When Robert Fisher's father dies, the team decides to execute their plan on a Trans-Pacific flight from Sydney to Los Angeles on which Robert Fisher is scheduled to be a passenger. On the plane, Cobb discreetly spikes Robert's drink with a sedative and the team enters into a shared dream with Robert. They manage to take Robert hostage but are immediately ambushed by a team of rifle-wielding assailants. Saito is gravely injured and Cobb realizes too late 
that experts have helped Robert militarize his subconscious against unwanted extraction. To make matters worse, Yusu's powerful sedative may leave, may leave whomever is killed in the dream in limbo, an unconstructed dream space. Although shaken, the team decides to continue with the plan. Cobb extracts combination lock numbers from Robert, who discusses his cold relationship with his father with his uncle Peter. In the back of Yusu's van, the team descends into its dream's second layer, a hotel lobby, where Ames po poses as a female thief, thief to distract Robert. Cobb, himself posing as a security expert, pretends to help Robert by alerting him to the robbery and leading him to a hotel room upstairs. Cobb manipulates Robert into becoming suspicious of the motives of his uncle Peter, and the three of them sink into a third layer of the dream, which takes place in and around snow blanketed for fortress. The team scurries to compete uh, to complete the inception mission uh, when they hear Yusuf, whose van has crashed off a bridge, give the kick. Edith Piaf's uh, Non Je Ne Regrette Rien song, uh, realizing they had limited time. The song is the alarm. Uh, Ariadne tells the rest of the team the quickest way to infiltrate the fortress. Arthur scrambles in the dream's second layer to improvise, to improvise an effective kick in the hotel where Cobb and the others are asleep, which has become zero gravity environment given that the falling van in the dream's first layer was falling. In the third layer, Robert reaches the fortress's strong room, but is shot dead by Maul, who suddenly appears. Cobb thinks the operation is over, but Ariadne uh, convinces him to go one layer deeper in order to save Robert and redeem the mission. Saito dies as Ames places ex explosive charges around the fortress to act as a third layer's kick. Cobb and Ariadne uh, descend into a fourth layer of the dream, a crumbling cityscape that Cobb and Maul built together in the 50 years they spent in limbo. Cobb confesses to Ariadne that he incepted the idea that Maul, in Maul, his ex dead, dead wife, that Limbo was not real, so that she would agree to wake up and be with their children. However, Maul continued to believe that reality was a dream and eventually committed suicide, leaving Cobb ridden with guilt. In a nearby building, Ariadne and Cobb find Maul and Robert, whom Ariadne wakes up so that he can infiltrate the fortress's strong room. Cobb tells Maul that she is not real, and Robert inputs a code in the strong room that reveals a large operating system with his dying father inside. Robert's father tells him to live his own life, rendering the inception complete. As the dream world collapses, Cobb tells Ariadne to kick, uh, to ride the kicks up through the layers of the dream while he rescues Saito, who just died uh, and is now in limbo. Cobb washes up on a shore and is dragged into Saito's house, just like in the film's opening scene. Saito, now old, recognizes Cobb as a man from a half-remembered dream, and the two of them suddenly wake up in the passenger airliner, Ariadne, Robert, Ames, and Saito, who have all successfully made it back to reality. Cobb arrives in the United States and is greeted by Stephen Miles, who takes him to his children. Cobb arrives home and goes outside to play with his children while his totem continues to spin. Thank you, Lisa. So um, just to uh, give everybody a sense of who's who in Christopher Nolan's inception, Leonardo DiCaprio is Cobb, Joseph Gordon-Levitt is Arthur, Elliot Page is Ariadne, Tom Hardy is Eames, uh, Ken Wan Wantanabe is Saito, uh, Dilip Barrow is Yusuf, uh, Celine Murphy is Robert Fisher. Um, Tom Berenger is Browning, the uncle. Marion uh, Cotiller is Mal. Um, Pete uh, Fosswhite is Maurice Fisher. Uh, Michael Kane is Miles. Lucas Haas is Nash. Uh, tai Lai Lee is Tadesh. Claire Gear is Philippa, the three-year-old. And Magnus Nolan is uh, James, a uh, 20-month-old uh, child. So those are the children of Cobb. So just to start out, like we've started out in all of our fairy tales, um, they have to go to sleep. 
So that's a given, right? So we've, we've discussed this over and over again. You go into the dream world, you fall asleep. In this, in, uh, in this movie, um, in this fairy tale, we look at it from, we could look at it from multiple perspectives. One perspective is that this is a collective dream. So that each individual in the dream has to resolve an issue. Um, so Cobb would be uh, one of the people, Ariadne would be one of the people, uh, Arthur would be one of the people, Eames would be one of the people who each person has to come to a resolution in the dream. Um, so, or we could look at it from a different perspective. We could look at the dream as one dream um, that points towards the individuation process. So we would probably go in both directions just to not confuse everybody, but to confuse everybody. But we're gonna, we're gonna start to look at them. So um, any thoughts, Eric? Do you, do you wanna, any comment on the, on the dream on the fairy tale? Um. <clears throat> Well, just, just from a movie watcher perspective mm -hmm. and from a dad perspective, I, I think this really doesn't get into all the machinations that are going on in the dream, but it just, it just, it just uh, kind of stunned me at seeing how powerful this urge of his was to get back to his children. I mean, that that drove him beyond everything else. He just had to get back to his children. And I think of, even though it's not an exact parallel, I think of the millions and millions of, of men who, <clears throat> as they age and as their children age, have a similar type of dynamic that goes on within them that I have to get back to my children and provide, now that I've been awakened to some things, I need to get back to my children and provide what I now know to their benefit. And, and that, that really stood out to me a lot, at being a father, that really stood out to me quite a bit. Just as an overarching theme that was kind of in the background, but yet kind of wasn't either. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Lisa, any thoughts? Oh, you know, I've, I've watched this movie a couple of times. Um, it's been a long time since I watched it last, but I never really understood it. It went over my head. There was so much information, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't until this time around, um, I guess this maybe was the third time I've ever seen it, that it Ooh. finally was like, I understood what was happening um, in terms of the dreamscapes. And it was so interesting to see it after having spoken with you two a couple weeks about dreamscapes and Jungian theories and um, much more engaging movie. And I, uh, I'm excited to talk about it today. So I, I think uh, one of the things that we start to look at is that this is, a, this is an individuation dream. This is a dream where we go from disunity to unity. Cobb appears on the water through coming out of the unconscious, coming from the water. As we've discussed before in our fairy tales, deep within the water is where the knowledge is. He comes from the water, outside the water. He is picked up by uh, security guards who bring him in front of Seto. One of the things that we think about when we think from a Jungian perspective is that the cop character is the dream ego. So if we look at it in a different way, so if the dream ego is in the, is walking through the dream, it's not literally him, although in Inception, um, the dream ego is um, much more conscious of the dream than uh, the usually dream ego. So if you're in the dream, you're not usually conscious that you're in the dream. There are rare moments where you have dreams where you're conscious that you're dreaming, those are more rare. In this case, they're conscious that they are dreaming and that they're in a dreamscape or a dream theater or a dream play. There are several aspects to this. One is that 
this uh, story has uh, the Arthurian legend of uh, Percival uh, hunts for the Holy Grail. And so in that case, Cobb would be Percival and he would be trying to um, help the dying king. And so we have several kings in the story. We have um, Sato, and we also have uh, Robert Fisher's father who is dying in a bed, the old king. Um, from the other perspective, there's also Greek myth in this story where Ariadne was um, the person who helped Theus uh, navigate um, the maze. She gave him a string and told him to uh, tie it at the door of the maze and then follow the string out of the maze because Theus wanted to go in and kill the Minotaur, but he, he couldn't get out of the maze. So Ariadne was the one who helped him get out of the maze. Eventually Ariadne would end up being the wife of Dionysus. Um, before that, she was married to Theus. So, so there's Greek myth, there's Arthurian legend, and then there is the Jungian aspect to uh, Inception, which is that we have all the different characters. We have the trickster in Eames. Um, we have um, Arthur, the lover. We have uh, uh, Ariadne, who is um, the magician in this case. Um, but she also represents the anima. So we have like the complexes being represented, the archetypal uh, aspects of the dream. Um, we, also, we also have Yusuf, who's the sage in the dream. He takes them into the underworld. When they meet Yusuf, they meet him um, in a basement with a lot of people who are addicted to their dreams, who live in their dreams. So he is the caretaker of the underworld. So when they bring in Yusuf, Yusuf takes them deeper into the dream. Deeper meaning that the layers of the archetypal dream, um, they kept moving from one layer to another layer. What they were doing uh, from a Jungian perspective was that their consciousness um, was slowly diluting in the unconscious. As they gain more and more information, it's like fishing. The more fish you pull into the boat, the heavier the boat gets. And the less likely you're gonna be able to keep pulling fish in because eventually the boat will drown. And so as, as Eric was talking earlier about Cobb and his children and getting back to his children, the children would be seen as the innocent in the dream. And it's going back to the original idea of what they started. And what Cobb and Mal started, that's his dead wife who is the shadow in the dream. She keeps appearing and she keeps wanting to destroy um, his plans. She keeps undermining him. Mm -hmm. She uh, <clears throat> attacks Ariadne at the beginning of the dream. We learn that Cobb cannot uh, build dreams anymore because um, his shadow destroys them. And so if he's conscious of the dream, she's conscious of the dream. So, and he has to deal with the shadow because of his guilt his immense guilt that his wife committed suicide. Um, so all these different aspects of the dreamers, of course, we also have Robert Fisher who they're trying to plant inception, which is an idea. It's how do you plant an idea in somebody's head? How do you plant it? And what they try to do is plant it in his dreams through the relationship with the father his very complicated relationship with the father, where we learn very early on that the maternal, the queen archetype is missing. She's dead. 
she's dead because as uh, Robert Fisher says, when my mother died, my father said, this is how it is. This is how life is. That was um, his way of consoling the child who has lost his mother. So the maternal is always missing. The queen archetype is missing from the dream. We have the kings, we have the warriors, we have the lovers, we have the magicians, um, and uh, we have all the aspects of the different archetypal um, energies. So one way to look at it is from an archetypal point of view, which is the different archetypal energies that exist in the dream. The other is the Jungians think of complexes, that our complexes come out in our dreams. Um, the complex of uh, the father, the complex of the lost mother, the complex of um, the lost innocence, the complex of the hero. So we could also look at Cobb as the hero in the dream. He's trying to save uh, his relationship, as Eric put it, with his children. He was trying to get home. The hero is always trying to get home. They need to finish their mission and get home. So it's complicated from different tasks, but let's take the dream as one dream of one person. In this case, the dream is Cobb is the dream ego. Uh, Mal is the shadow. Ariadne is the anima. Uh, Eames is the trickster. Um, Arthur is um, the puer or the eternal child. Um, Yusuf is the sage. Um, and um, the character of Sado is the wise king or the father. And uh, the Robert Fisher character who they're trying to implant the idea of is the wayward prince, is the, is the, is the child who's growing up, the child who will become king, the child who will take father's place. So in these characters, what we have um, is that they're going deeper and deeper into the dreamscape. And what we learn is that your subconscious will attack you the more you become, uh, the more time you spend in the dream. So they use the term subconscious instead of the unconscious. So that, was, that, that is an ode to Freud. Freud uses the term subconscious. Jung doesn't use the term subconscious. He uses unconscious and uh, the collective unconscious. So in the beginning uh, scene is that um, Cobb, the character, goes to find a new architect because the last architect failed them and then gave them up. Failed them because didn't get the um, details correct. And Sato was aware of what they were doing because he was rubbing his face against the carpet and he realized that the carpet was made out of um, polyester instead of wool. His carpet was made out of wool. So the architect made a mistake in the architecture of the dream. So this is just some of the ideas that um, we're going to discuss today um, and see where we get to. It's a little haphazard, but as we move through Inception, you will start to gain a better feel for this fairy tale. And that's how I'm going to think about it. I think that's the way we're going to approach it, is that as a fairy tale. Like we approach the other fairy tales that we started with in um, von Franz's archetypal um, symbols in fairy tales. So there are archetypal symbols in this fairy tale. Any thoughts, anybody? I enjoyed hearing the breakdown of the different um, Jungian 
archetypal characters. That was really helpful. Uh, I got some of them, but not all of them. And um, I'm also glad you said something about the subconscious and that being a Freudian term, because that, that was one of the things I really didn't care about in the movie is the fact they kept referring to the unconscious as the subconscious. But once you explained it, it makes sense why they're doing it. Lisa? No, let's talk about um, going deeper into our unconscious and individuation. So the individuation process is, is when we think of Jungian psychology, we go from disunity in the dream to unity, or we move through life from disunity to unity, where we are several different parts that want different things. Your ego wants something, your shadow wants something, your anima wants something, your animus wants something, your... Um, your persona wants something, you know, all the different parts of you want something. They pull you in different directions as your ego grows more and more in strength. The major character in the movie is the self. The self is the collective aspect of all the different parts. All of them make up one. And that's the thing to remember about Inception. They can only operate as a group because all of them are one. They compensate for each other. Cobb cannot do it by himself. He needs an architect. He no longer knows how to build. His fear, his anxiety, his guilt, his sense of loss. Um, because in the beginning uh, of this story, what we can infer is that what he started doing with Mal was more of they were actively working on using dreams um, for maybe treatment or maybe exploration. Uh, it wasn't intended to go into people's unconscious and steal ideas. He wasn't, in, he wasn't, his intent wasn't to become a thief. It was more of, he was an explorer. Mm. And what happens later is when he, uh, one mall cannot tell the difference between reality and she commits suicide. She leaves a letter for the police that states that he killed her. So that's one of the reasons that he can't go home. He can't go back to his kids. And throughout the movie, the kids never age, which is also a symbol of the unconscious because in the unconscious, time is irrelevant. What seems like an eternity is a couple of minutes. What seems like years is is five minutes. So he tells Ariadne that he was in the dream state for over 50 years, but actually 50 years was more like 15 minutes because time does not exist in the unconscious. Space and time do not exist. You can move from place to place in a split second, as we see in the dream. As they go deeper in the dream, they keep changing landscapes. One of the other things that's interesting is at the beginning, he tells her, do not use anything from our reality. He says, you can use pieces, but do not construct places because that's how you get lost. And the other beautiful thing is the totem. The totem is the part that brings you back. It's the part you hold on to that keeps you connected to reality, to the outside world. And if you remember from our earlier fairy tales, there is an external world and there's a spirit world. They exist in the spirit world. And the symbols in the spirit world are amazing, right? What do we have? 
We have the deep unconscious in the water. We have the crumbling outside reality. If you look at the beachhead, you see all these buildings that are crumbling, that are falling apart. And then you have the conflict with Maul, between Maul and Cobb, that continually undermines everything they try to do. So he is undermining everything they're trying to do. Ariadne picks this up right away, right? Because she, in a lot of ways, she's the magician in the group. She sees things that they don't see. She's <clears throat> the creative aspect. So the anima is always creation. It's always inspiration. So this part, when she comes in, she sees all the problems that are occurring. She's attacked by Maul right away. She's attacked by the shadow. The shadow is saying, I don't want you near this. I want you out. Right? Dr. Lahab, the, the, the theme that you just mentioned is one that kept uh, I kept gravitating to throughout the movie, and that's the relationship between Cobb and Maul. And, and it, it really got me to thinking about things that we've talked about in, in other uh, meetings, is that you can't block uh, you can't block trauma connections uh from coming into your conscious mind because if you do they will always have powerful effects on you Ooh. no matter how much you ignore them or think they're gone like she was gone Ooh. she had died but it wasn't resolved Ooh. he had not resolved all of that with her Ooh. and so her effect she still had these powerful effects upon him and you can't you can't just ignore those kinds of connections and and um, relationships you have to bring them up and address them yeah well, this is, they're fragments right they're fragments of his psyche <clears throat> and they keep attacking him because he keeps uh, trying to disassociate from them right yeah yeah, and the only way to keep them from attacking you is to meet it head on and mm -hmm. consciously and, and work on resolving it. And, and so that that kept hitting me throughout the movie. And it was she was just like dominating him all throughout the movie. Well, that's what the shadow does. The yes. shadow aspect of you when you are trying to pretend it does not exist will come after you. The more you run away from it, the more it will dominate you, as Eric put it. It will continue to dominate you. It will continue to go after you. It will continue to egg you on. It will continue to talk in your ear. It will continue to tell you how bad you are. How, how you're, you're not going to get any better. That you, you just need to give up. And part of that is what we talk about you know, the, the aspect of the shadow is the aspect of the part of you that you deny yourself. So he lives with his guilt, but he doesn't want to think about his guilt, so he throws it into the shadow. He lives with shame. He doesn't want to talk about the shame of not being with his children. He throws that in shadow. He lives with judgment where he feels that it was his fault. And later, as we discover, the first time he tried to use Inception, he used it with Maul, which screwed up her psyche. He was trying to get her out of the dream state, out of the unconscious. So he planted an idea. And another that, thing, Dr. Lahab, oh. another thing that, that kind of makes you proud of him, because this is not easy to do, is that he had opportunity after opportunity to put Maul aside, to try to let her go, to quit dealing with it. I think, I think Ariadne even tried to encourage him to do that at one time. 
but I, I forgot what ha I forgot what particular she, scene it was. She encouraged him to face to face her. And oh, that it was go. Somebody, okay. It was somebody else that mm -hmm. did the opposite then. But 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 what I was the point I was leading to is that you can't make that stuff come to you if you're not willing. He kept showing a willingness over and over again to deal with it, to address it, to meet it head on. And you can't deal with those kinds of past trauma connections if you're not willing to do so. You, there has to be a willingness. Well, he kept wanting to embrace it, for sure. He kept wanting to embrace it and pretend it didn't exist. He kept wanting to talk it out of whatever it was thinking. Like what, in one scene where he says, why don't you sit here? And he starts talking to her and he's actually trying to trick her. And the, the part of it is you cannot run away from yourself. Yeah. That's why she kept popping up everywhere he was because she was an aspect of his psyche. Like everybody else in the dream, they're all aspects of your psyche. Even the people who are attacking you, even the assassins who come to kill you, the security who come to destroy you, they are aspects of your psyche. They are aspects of you. Uh, there's a point where, I don't know what you guys thought of this. Um, there's a point where Ariadne uh, pushes, goes and she finds where he's hiding. And she goes into the elevator. And she goes, what is down there? So you know, this is deep within the unconscious is where the basement, right? The symbol of the depth of the unconscious where the collective unconscious resides. He's like, you can't go down there. I don't want you to go down there. And she pu pushes the button anyway, and she goes down there. And what she finds is that he's still romancing his shadow. That he still wants to, um, wants to sit there in his misery and pain. He wants to, he wants to dance and wine and dine with his misery and pain. And that's where she goes, did you tell everybody else about this? Have you, told, have you told the others what you've been doing down here? Right. But she, has, she is, a, is a creative symbol. Mm, uh, the anima, the anima gives inspiration. It gives creativity. It, it helps you fall in love. It helps connect you to the world. She saves him in the end. It's her intense pushing of him to face his conflict, his fear, his dread, his judgment, his shame, his loss that helps them get out of that situation. Although there's a question about, do they really get out of the dream or does yeah. the dream keep going? Yeah. Lisa? Um, going back to the basement scene, um, Ariadna eavesdrops into why he's going into his unconscious. And that's where she finds him romancing um, his shadow. The basement is actually the, the day that she committed suicide. The, mm. is, wasn't it? Am I remember that correctly? It's the same, it's it's the it's same the, hotel room from, is, yes. The, yeah, anniversary hotel yeah. room. Yeah, yes. it, that, that is the moment or the end, the traumatic event that um, creates the, the existence of the shadow for um, Cobb. Um, what was that hotel room? Oh, that was good. Which is in the basement. <laughs> he doesn't even want to see it himself. He doesn't. Nobody goes there. He rarely goes there, probably. He knows what's there, clearly knows what's there. <laughs> well, the basement shows up in different parts of the, of the movie. Mm. Um, when they go find Yusuf, he also walks into the basement. Oh, because he's he going deep. He walks all the way down, and he finds these people who are basically, um, it was like a heroin den, but this is their addiction is to live in the dream world and not mm -hmm. live in the outer world. Mm -hmm. And they have a caretaker. It's basically the caretaker is Hades. And this is the underworld. This mm -hmm. is where, 
the souls of the dead reside in the underworld. Those who were unable to complete a task um, have done something in life that has haunted them, that mm -hmm. kept them from moving forward, that kept them from being liberated, that kept coming after them. And what Yusuf tells him is that he can take him deeper and deeper into the dream. And the problem is, is that with Cobb as the hero, is like he's always trying to find a way to resolve the issue without killing Maul. And what happens is in the, in the dream is that Ariadne actually shoots Maul and tells him to get out. Like, get out, get out. Like, this part of you has to die. This part of you has to die. You have to let go of this. And he refuses. I mean, until the last second, he was still refusing to let go of it. Probably why the ending shows that he might have never really escaped from the dream. Yeah. Um, what's fascinating about Inception is that it takes Carl Jung's theory and shows all the different complexes. So you have all the complexes as characters who are talking to each other, who are pretending that they're separate and apart from each other. So you have uh, you have Arthur uh, who who's like who's like you know uh, this is a bad idea. Doesn't say I'm not going to be involved. Just says this is a bad idea. Doesn't say I'm not going to do this with you. Just says it's a bad idea. You know. So we pick up on the nuance of the way the characters speak to each other. When he meets um, Ames and. Um, Mombasa, and uh, they're sitting at a cafe, and he's being tracked, right? He's being tracked by these nefarious figures who are from uh, the people who hired him to invade Sato's dream. So he tells the trickster to go talk to them and give him time to escape. So what does the trickster do? He says, hey, what? aren't you uh, this guy? He's like, well, I guess not. And he has enough time to escape. When he escapes, he escapes into the underworld. Where does he escape to? He goes to the basement. He goes, finds Yusuf in a basement, in a deep lair underneath the earth, deep within the unconscious. So what's, uh, what's fascinating about the dream is that it, it keeps going deeper and deeper into the unconscious. Right? There are really no layers, but what you're looking at is the less conscious you become. That's the layer. The deeper you go in, the less conscious you are of where you are. The more real it becomes. The more likely you will be, um, you will be trapped. I have to put in a plug for help and assistance here because yes, I was kind of proud of him for not just trying to put it all aside and never thinking about it and dissociating away from it, which a lot of people do with their past pain, mm -hmm. understandably so. He didn't do that. He kept, he was willing to keep facing it. Now that doesn't mean that he did it correctly. He didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He kept trying to, he kept trying to make it work again, but it didn't work when he kept trying to make. And and what is it that people, myself included, with past issues, what do I do without the help of other people? I make the same mistakes over and over again with it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see a new way out, a new avenue. I don't see. I need to go this direction instead of this direction, or, or sometimes it just needs to die like it did in the movie. And he had help in having that be accomplished for him. And in the same way, we all need help too at times, 
even if we're willing, even if we've got the good heart to want to go back and try to deal with it, it doesn't mean we're going to be successful at it without the help of others. Mm. So I have to make that plug. Mm. So in a lot of ways, you know, the death in the dream state is always about transformation. You transform from one thing to another. You become more conscious of certain things because you need to let other things go. He cannot go home without letting go of mom. He can't go home. But at the same time, the only way he can get home is to face her. Yes. The transformation of aspect does not work by running away from it. You must be there. You can't romance it. You can't lie to it. <laughs> you can't say, yeah. oh, by the way, you know, we'll stand up for ourselves next meeting. You know, oh, the only reason I didn't stand up for you this time was because, you know, the boss was there. Next meeting, I'll stand up for you. And next meeting, and next meeting, and next meeting, and next meeting. And you're still telling the same lie to yourself. You're still telling that part of yourself that you will stand up for you when you don't. So what does Yusuf say to them? Yusuf, say, Yusuf says, um, author looks at him and says, oh, by the way, um, um, did you tell them that you might not be able to wake them up? So author knows. He knows Yusuf hasn't like been fully, because the self, the self is, is immense. Yet it needs all the individual parts to become conscious. Otherwise, it's just going to pull them in deeper and deeper. And so they go to, um, they find themselves on a snowy mountain, which we're going to cover next week. We're going to go back to the mountains uh, in von Franz's archetypal symbols and fairy tales. But they go from the streets to the oceans, to the crumbling cities, to the mountains, to the palaces. And then everything is destroyed again. As things are destroyed, new things arise. This is the transformational aspect of the psyche. This is how we become who we are. We cannot hold on to our pain because our pain will not let us transform. We need to be able to embrace it and let it go. We cannot sit there in pain and keep screaming in pain, saying, oh, I can't get over this. Psyche won't let you. The individuation process will not let you not resolve the issue. As we see in Cobb, as Eric was saying earlier, he cannot let the issue go. He has to face it over and over and over again. This is Psyche's process. Psyche says, oh, this is what you fear? You're going to have to face it. This is what you're scared of? This is what terrorizes you? You're going to have to sit with it. You're going to have to face it. You're going to have to tell it. You're going to have to talk to it. You know, um, when they're, they're trying Ariadne, this is where it goes into the Greek myth of the maze and the minotaur. He asks her to, be, to draw a maze, to draw a puzzle. So she draws a puzzle, the first puzzle, the second puzzle, and then she draws the Mandela puzzle. Then she's hired. That's where the ode to Young comes in. So you see that it's taking different pieces of mythology. And what he does is he, he co-ops. So the totem has to be yours. The totem cannot be anybody else's. But he co-ops his wife's totem. He takes her totem and he uses her totem. So that means that he 
even when he is in waking life, he's being haunted by the same thing. Mm -hmm. And when he tells Ariadne, he says, this is my fault. I did this. And you could tell um, there was a beautiful scene where he's walking past old houses. These are psychological structures that used to be, that are no longer relevant. It says, this, is, this was her parents' house. This was our house. This is the house we wanted to build. But as you see, this is the evolution of the psyche. Psyche never stands still. It's a constant momentum of movement, of change, of the individuation process. So inception, in a lot of ways, is about, it's about individuation. It's about becoming whole. So I wanted to ask what, what we thought of the different characters, what we, we thought their dilemmas were. So we've talked a lot about Cobb, but I would also like to talk about the other characters. Can I say something about yeah. Mal? Yeah. One thing that <clears throat> really struck me is because Mal represents the shadow and we have the tendency, I say we, in general, people have the tendency to think of our shadow or dark side always being something that's malevolent or evil or tricky or negative. And yet that's not true. The shadow is very good at being something that can be presented as just the opposite. I remember them sitting at a table and they were both leaning in toward one another, looking at each other and she looked at him in a way that was just so loving and alluring. And you're going, my gosh, no wonder he wants her back. She really cares about him. And yet, that's what the shadow can do. It reminded me of a book that I read probably 30, 40 years ago by C.S. Lewis. For those of you who are familiar with him, it's called The Screw Tape Letters. And the entire book is about a relationship with the devil and how the devil looks like all the things can, can sound and look like all the things in life that seem normal and good. Ooh. And yet behind it is behind that presentation is something altogether different. Ooh. And um, so, so, so that's what I wanted to say about Molly as much as you kind of could be rooting for them to get back together, uh, she is, that side of her is not that real. Well, she's an aspect of his psyche. So it's, uh, uh, you're, root, you're rooting for him to become whole. That's what you're rooting for in the dream. You're rooting for him to be able to come to, come to a point of peace within himself. And to be able to do that, you have to let go of the past. You can't move forward if you're anchored in the past. That's one of the major themes in the dream. If your anchor is, in, is deep within the past, you cannot walk. As you try to walk, it pulls you back. It brings you back. That's what the fragments of trauma do. They pull you back. They take you back to that original trauma. They take you back to that point in time. They take you back in different ways. They take you back as, oh, you remember what happened the day before? You had a great day. But then this happened. They take you back. They take you back. And the more they take you back, the more you are stuck in the past. And of course, that is absolutely the, deeper, the more deeper meaning, the more deeper psychological and meaning that relates to one's individuation i was focusing on kind of the external just as a movie goer watching how that part that i was describing 
is something that can happen on the outside before you get to those deeper meanings. You are rooting for them to kind of resolve an issue. Unfortunately, in rooting for them to resolve an issue, she had already killed herself. Right. So there is no way to rewrite the past. This is the other part. Doesn't mean we don't try to. No, I know. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. But this is about like rewriting the past. Yeah. Instead of being anchored in the past, now I want to go back and rewrite it. Well, you can't rewrite the past. As much as you try to rewrite the past, you can't rewrite the past. Nope. Moving forward requires of letting go, of transformation, of destruction, of all that we held, no matter what it was. Our childhood notions, our innocence, our, our sense of, uh, our sense of, connectedness our sense of it doesn't matter what it is for us to move forward we have to be able to let it go it could be a lover it could be a friend it could be a situation it could be a trauma it could be um, a distant place it could be a distant thought an idea what does he say to say though he says there is there's nothing more powerful, nothing than an idea. There's nothing more powerful than an idea because the idea of us being able to rewrite the past is so beautiful, so elegant. What do you think, Lisa? That's on that idea, um, extraction, getting an idea out, Mm. symbolic you find a safe mm. you go mm. deep mm. you uncover their defenses that's fairly simple mm. the script for that um, extraction is pretty routine mm. um, you can predict and and um, make counter moves ahead of time mm. but the inception mm. putting an idea in there is almost audacious mm. <laughs> um, and difficult and um violates natural law in some mm. ways and and um and it because it's requires not your psyche. layers and layers and layers in order for it to be even possible because it's not your psyche you're no. you're you're planting an idea so it was be me like planting an idea in your head and making you believe it's your idea that's right this is why you try when you try to convince people that they're not sick um, they hold on to their original idea because you're introducing an idea that doesn't make sense to them. It's not theirs. Mm -hmm. I think Ames described, um, he was, you know, in the, in the design of how do we do this? Mm -hmm. He described it as it has to be um, natural and it has to be appear innocuous mm -hmm. or like um, not, not even a real big deal. Yes. Used to be subtle in that way. Yes, it has to. It has to. Um, I was thinking of the term organic. It has to yeah. feel organic to you. Right. It has to feel it's yours. It's being born out of you. Mm -hmm. Although we know a lot of ideas are not born out of us, but the idea that it's born out of us, that it's our creation, makes it powerful. I have a question. I, yeah. I would. Uh, I was thinking about this too, and I'm going to again say this from kind of a general movie-going perspective. And I'd yeah, love, yeah, I'd love to get a deeper take on it, like you did just a minute ago, and for, from from either from either you or Lisa, and that is his relationship with her reminded me a lot of a number of dysfunctional relationships, even abusive relationships. And even if something's wrong with the other person, the fight to want to get it back and not leave it and to do anything to try to win it back and get it back, even if you know it's dysfunctional. Why in the world do we do that? Because it's we did familiar. <laughs> it is intimate. <laughs> you go back to create he ha, he was so intimate with his wife 
Every time he went into his dreamscape, it was his best companion. You don't, you don't recall the whole enchilada. Right. <laughs> That's you true. You don't, you don't recall that like hot pepper that was inserted yeah. in the enchilada. <laughs> You remember the first two bites oh. of the enchilada. Oh, yeah. that was delicious. Oh my yeah. God, I will never have this again. No, no, no. No, but that was good. You don't remember the entail and the pain and suffering that it caused you. You don't remember those pieces because of guilt in this case. In this case, this is about guilt and shame and judgment. I, I, I pushed her, so to, for the movie going folks, I pushed her to her death. And therefore I must eternally suffer and I can't let her go. I can't even pretend she's not here because I did this to her. I did this to her. And what happens is in a lot of ways is what happens in trauma. When you're traumatized, you fault yourself. If I wasn't there, I wouldn't have gotten raped. If I wasn't there, I wouldn't have gotten beaten. If I wasn't there, I wouldn't have seen those kids get killed. If I was there, if I wasn't, th if I, if I was there, why didn't I save them? Why didn't I fight back? Why didn't I scream for help? Judgment, shame. You were in shock. It doesn't matter how I explain it because it's not going to fit your understanding. And this, is, and this is what we use jam for. We use jam for inception. We use jam exactly for the implementation of an idea. The idea that I am not afraid. I am amazing. I am loved, I am not alone. I am free of fear. I am free of shame. We use jam, and part of the reason I was so attracted to have you guys do Inception with me was because it's so much about jam. It's so much about the movement and the creation of resolution, of resolving these issues that trouble us over and over and over again that hold us hostage, that keep us from moving forward, that anchor us in the past, that anchor us to an idea that is not true. Negative self-talk, that arose from what? That arose from the original trauma. That arose from Mal killing herself. The shame of that. I killed their mother. I killed my children's mother. I deprived them of their mother. And now I can't be a father to them because I'm guilty, right? I can never go back. So he's fighting to go back, but he also states, I can never go back. So that keeps you from going back. Mm -hmm. That keeps you from being reunited. That keeps you from your innocence. Those children represents innocence. How we used to feel before the trauma. So if we think of what Kalshet talks about, uh, reconnecting that part of us that's innocent. And if you see the way they film the kids. There's, they're not, they're not real. Yeah. They're just a glimpse of innocence. They run around and they play like butterflies. They're like not a Hallmark real. Card. <laughs> huh? Like a Hallmark card. <laughs> yes, yes, they're not real. They're just innocence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just the idea of innocence. It's just the idea of that's our innocence. That's our innocence before we lost it in the trauma. The trauma disconnects us from our innocence. It disconnects us from ourselves. 
It keeps us lost. It keeps us fighting the same demons over and over again. Who are the demons? Men who show up with rifles, assassins, and pieces of us that keep turning us in. What does she say when they catch, when, when they catch Arthur and Cobb, when Mal turns them into Sato? She looks at Arthur and says, yeah, I don't have to kill him, but pain is real in the dream. Yeah. And she shoots him in the knee and he screams in pain, right? And then Cobb jumps over the table to shoot him in the head so he could wake up from the dream. Well, so who shot him in the knee? Was it Mal or was it the psyche of... So that keeps you like... So why did you take it out on him? Because the trauma keeps you blaming yourself. The trauma keeps you second guessing yourself. And the trauma keeps you pushing away people who want to help you. Very true. Very good point. Arthur is a very loyal ally to him. He goes into the missions without question. Right? He always goes into the mission. So why, why do I want to hurt this guy? Well, I want to hurt him because he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to help me. And when we're traumatized, we hurt those people who have tried to help us. We push them away. We tell them, I, I don't need your help. I don't want your help. It's like saying to them, I want to be in pain. I don't care what you want to do. I'm going to be in pain. I am going to suffer. I'm not going to let you get involved in my suffering. Except I need you around. <laughs> I need you to be here. Sometimes they're just there because they see you suffering. Yeah, I think we talked about this like in the last couple of weeks. We talked about how we need to let those people who want to help us in, right? When we talked about depression, how we need to let those people around us in, we need to let them help us, let them be there for us. We, we have a real difficult time with that, especially when we're blaming ourselves. Self-blame is huge. What do you think, Lisa? What do you think of Inception as Jamp? I think that is, it, it really is, yeah. It is, Jamp I think is a great analogy of description of, of uh, knocking on the door of the unconscious and putting in a new idea. <laughs> it's, it's Inception. Yeah. <laughs> Very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the movie in general? Was it entertaining? Did you like, did you get into it? Were you like rooting for somebody like Eric or? You know, you end the movie and go, so is he still in the unconscious? <laughs> <laughs> Does the totem fall? So now what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Does he make it home? Uh-huh. Yeah. Does it matter also? Yeah, does it matter. Does it matter? Yeah. But there's a part of us always wants a resolution. You're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that that was me. It was like, okay, let me take a look at uh, the totem. Is it spinning? Is it about to stop? Is it really? Yeah. You know, are they messing with me? Are, I, and I was thinking after the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, there's a sequel. <laughs> 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 I got excited. I haven't watched many movies in the last five years because it, they're just there's just not very many good movies mm. out there. And I, I was pretty shocked when I saw this one. I didn't know that there were people that still put this kind of depth of thought into movies, especially mm. with big stars in it. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And it was, it was pretty amazing to me. And it was difficult. It's not an easy movie to get. Mm. I've watched it twice now. I, 
I'm looking forward to watching again now that we've gone through it. Um, but, but you can at least tell, even though all the stuff that I was not understanding, I could tell that there was layers of depth throughout the movie. Uh, and it, it was, it was impressively written Ooh. really was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in, in so many different ways is like, what are we, what is our task in life? What are we trying to get back to? What are, what do we have to face? You know, what demons do we have to face? How are we going to face these demons to move forward? Are we doing what Cobb does, which is pretend we're facing them, but we're really just immersing ourselves in our pain, our suffering, just sleeping with that idea of pain and suffering because we deserve it? Are we really trying to move forward? Are we still holding on to the past? Are we stuck? Are we not moving? Are we not able to see it for what it is? Which is this part needs to die. So another part can grow. He'll never be able to be a father if he carries that guilt and shame and judgment. He will never be able to be a father he will always consider himself the person who killed their mother. He will never be able to be that which he wants to be because he can't let go of what he thinks he's done. For me, personally, the overriding theme for me is kind of like what Churchill said after London had been devastated in World War II, and he, the shortest speech, I think, on the planet by a politician. And he just said, never, never, never give up. Ooh. That was his speech. Ooh. And to me, the movie was, that's what the movie was saying to me. It was all about tenacity. Never give up, even though you're not winning. <laughs> just because you're not winning doesn't mean to give up. Ooh. Keep fighting. Get help and until things get resolved otherwise you'll have to live with it torturing you the rest of your life and it was just such a great lesson for that to me a good such a great reminder of that to me if that makes sense never give up never surrender yes yes paralleling that with the movie eric yeah i could see like he when Cobb made killed his hit, killed his killed them all and said goodbye or said goodbye and like faced his shadow or faced his truth was what it was. Um, he didn't stop because the end result was still to go home and he had to go he had to go deeper one more time and go to another world to find um, Saito and pull them back because. Uh, he needed to complete it. So he wasn't quite done yet. Um, having um, passed Maul. Well, I don't know, maybe, to, anyways. He could well, pulling back <laughs> Saito is pulling back the old self, right? Mm -hmm. Because Saito had forgotten where he was. <laughs> so we had to pull back the old self and say, we need to get out of here. Because that's mm -hmm. what was stuck. After he confronts Maul, he yeah. has to go and talk Saito out of staying there. Mm -hmm. Because Saito was lost deep within the unconscious. Saito is that part of him that had been lost for a long time. The father, the symbol of the father. He couldn't be a father without facing his guilt and shame. Now he has to get that idea that symbol of the father out mm. so he can become that which he lost wow i didn't think about that that was a good point from both of you thank you mm -hmm. yeah saito has many different aspects many different symbols in there yeah. in the he doesn't he doesn't like try to retaliate i mean he does with the architect 
but he doesn't try to retaliate against him. He, he gives him a choice. He says, what if I could get you home? He said, what guarantee do I have? He says, I have no guarantees. He's, he's, he, he holds within him that kingship, that wisdom, mm. that, that judicious op- creation. He's a mm. creator too, and he's creating an opportunity. And it, it's interesting that when Saito dies and goes to limbo land, mm. he's, you know, he has an, several more decades that he's surviving in limbo land because time is mm. extended there. And when Cobb finds him, he is still a king. He is a leader. Yes. He is the one, he is a, a king in his palace that, mm. that was built. He, yeah, he was, he's still Yes, king. because the, the, the king lives deep within the self. The queen lives deep within the self. Mm-hmm. Once we are able to touch that part of ourselves, we are able to become more whole. You know, that's the, that's the symbol of the self. It's the it's the ultimate symbol, and um, at a certain point, um, he goes he goes to get Saito. There's a, he pleads with him. He pleads with him to come with him. So he's pleading with self. I want to emerge. I want to come back. I want to be whole again. I want the unity. I want, I want this wholeness. Saito suggests, he says, what, uh, when he asks him, he said, uh, you know, Arthur is telling him to move on. Arthur is saying, well, just don't listen to this guy. He's going to get us killed. So Arthur was not even conscious of what Saito was offering. Arthur later becomes very conscious of what is being offered. And therefore he like goes out of his way to recreate um, and save them. And the more they try to save themselves, the deeper they fall into the unconscious where the architect goes, I didn't create this. Well, why didn't you create like a beach? Why are we on a mountain with snow and ice? <laughs> and I, like, uh, I didn't create this. I don't know whose psyche this is. And so uh, there's, a, there's a part of it where you get lost in the unconscious, what you think you are conscious of, what you think you are in control of, what you think you can do. Um, it's not up to you. You cannot manipulate the unconscious. And that's why all the different aspects of the unconscious keeps like throwing twists and turns and tears them apart and moves them forward and moves them backwards and says, oh, okay, now you guys got what you want. Really? Did you? And then it keeps like pushing the agenda. Like, I don't think you got what you want. I think you're still lost. I love the uh, the staircase. It was a a, a a replay of M. C. Escher's famous drawing yeah. of the stairs. I, I love that being in there. Yeah, uh, just as a side point. But I did. Well, have that's another... the maze, right? Yeah. 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 You are always going up. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're always going up. But I yeah. mean, if you haven't, if you've never seen an M.C. Escher book, get one for mm. those of you who yeah. never aren't familiar with M.C. Escher. Yeah. Um, Young would have a ball if he ever did a, you know, if he ever did an expose on Ooh. or commentary on M.C. Escher's drawings. Ooh. But I wanted to bring up a re- another relate, always relation, little relationship things always stick out to me. And and it was when Fisher, the the wayward prince, was with his father, the king. And it just reminded me from years of life I've lived and years of counseling that I've done is how often something as simple as just basic communication that doesn't take place between a son and their father. And his son 
thought when he said disappointed that he was disappointed in him for not becoming like him. Mm -hmm. And then finally, right before he died, he said, no, I was disappointed that you wanted to. That you wanted to be like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. And I'm going, oh my gosh, can't y'all just have a conversation about it at mm. some point in your lives? Yeah. Do you have to wait till you're on your deathbed to finally express it? What's the matter with us men? I don't know. What, what the other the other side of that is that that's where Cobb would have been. He would have been the old man who disappointed and angered and um, disavowed his son. That would have been his fate. Yeah. So there were two contrasting fates. One to be the sick old man in the bed whose son is, is pleading with him to love him. And the other is the old man, Saito, who um, he comes to save. They both come to save these men. And they're both coming to save themselves. So there was this mirror play between these two relationships, Calvin Saito and Robert Fisher and his father. Now, the Tom Berenger character was of... Uh, of interest because he was also the shadow. He I was, was wondering about that. He was the shadow that was unseen. Where Maul was the shadow that was seen. He was the shadow that was unseen. He was the corrupter that was unseen. He was so unconscious of him, always wanted him to be his father. But this guy was not a good father. He was deceptive. He had his own agenda. Thanks for bringing him up. I wanted to, I was I wanted to ask about him earlier and just forgot. Yeah, there's um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very deep movie. There are different there are different aspects of this movie. There. Uh, pieces that like go up and down. Uh, Ariadne and Cobb have this long conversation over and over again about what it is that he needs to do and what he refuses to do. Uh, Arthur's uh, relationship with Ariadne is um, interesting also. Um, what he knows and what he refuses what he knows and refuses to do about. Like he knows all this stuff about Cobb, but he's just there anyway. When she leaves and she feels like, you know, these guys are dangerous, uh, Cobb says to Arthur, she'll be back. And when she comes back, Arthur says to her, he, he knew you would come back because they're all one aspect of each other, right? So, so they're, they're always like pinging off each other because they're one. But they think of themselves as separate individuals is the same way with the complexes. It's the way the complexes carry the trauma. Each, each complex will carry part of the trauma. And within the complex, the complex does not carry the entire trauma. A part of it will be in in one complex, another part will be another complex. That's another really good point. Thank you. And that's why those pieces always butt up against each other. But if I forgive myself, how can I forgive myself? Well, that's the easy way out by forgiving yourself. Well, that's a different voice. That's another complex. That's another aspect of the trauma that's fighting. Another moviegoer question. Ooh. It's hard not to feel bad for Nash, the first architect. I mean, you know, the poor guy was doing his job and he winds up getting killed. I mean, <laughs> well, he needed to go. Why did he need to go? He needed to go because he was ineffective. It was a false, it was a false start. It was a false, it was a false part of the self. 
because the architect is, is part of the self, is the part of the true self. And when he starts out on this road, he has a part of the false self and that part of the false self was going to get him killed. Right. And, and he say, tried to save himself by turning Cobb in. Yeah. That part of the self, that false self is the one that's going to get you killed. Mm -hmm. It's the one who's going to cause you the most pain because it was created. It was created after the trauma. It was created to take care of you after the trauma. That means it wasn't whole. It was, there was a lot of problems with it because we tried to like cobble up pieces after trauma and make them into something which we are not. So it's always kind of a lack of, but he asked him, Cobb asked Saito, he says, what are you going to do to him? I think they throw him off the building. <laughs> he says, what, do you, what are you going to do with him? He goes, oh, don't worry about him. It's the false part of the self. It needs to go. That's the first thing that needs to die. And it, exactly what happens in the movie is the first thing that dies. Yeah. It's the false part of the self. It has to go. Otherwise, they're all in danger. Yeah. Otherwise, they're all in danger, but he's in danger in the end. They're all one. And even though I understood that, I still felt bad for the poor guy. <laughs> well, yeah, so, so what happens to the false self? The false self arises to protect you after major trauma. Mm -hmm. But it's inefficient. It's childish. It's, it, it came from fear and shame and blame. It was born out of pain. And therefore its existence is dangerous to you. And, and so of enough, course we feel sad about it because it's part of us. I know, but you know. No, no, I, I, can no, I, be I, a, get, I get your point, I get your point. Can I be a little bit sentimental? <laughs> uh, you can, you can, but that's what we have to let go. Actually, uh, that's a great point. But we but, have to let go of the sentimentality of yes. it. Yes, but the good thing, is, one of the interesting things is, is everything you just described mm. about what it was. He did a terrific job of showing those feelings on his face. Yeah, everything you just mentioned that he was, he showed all of those expressions on his face. Yeah. You know, from the fear to, I mean, he was sweating. I mean, you could tell that he was out of his element. Oh, yes, for sure. Did a good job of acting. I remember seeing him when he was a little kid in some movie. Lisa, any, any thoughts before we call it for the day? Trying to decide if he's still in his unconscious. <laughs> well, that's that's You're why they have to go right see now. the movie. Yeah. You're in my dream right now, Lisa. <laughs> uh oh. I don't know how we're going to get out of this one, Lisa. Well, with that, I want to uh, bid everybody farewell until next week, where we go back to Von Franz's archetypal. Um, archetypal symbols and fairy tales, and we will be discussing the mountain. I am Dr. Lahab Al Samurai. This is the IFC Individuation Podcast. Dr. Tomlinson, you wanna to say anything? Uh, yes, I did. I, yeah. am ne I am never for the rest of my life ever gonna eat an enchilada again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Lisa. Do you want to take the pepper out of uh, Eric's enchilada, please? <laughs> I am not afraid, Eric. Not, I'm not afraid. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Uh, we will see you next week. It was our pleasure to be here with you this week. <laughs>